Thanks, Simon. Um, uh, I think, as you can see from, from the earlier speakers, it's pretty evident that um, the energy system is now moving in sort of a new and challenging direction where you know, the focus on sustainability is pretty much creating a paradigm shift in terms of how power systems are, are constituted and managed with move away from what we would traditionally have called traditional linear value chain models to more joined up and integrated approaches where energy and in particular ICT are increasingly interlinked and intertwined and the customer is increasingly at the forefront. And all of this is happening at the same time as we're seeing more integration with Europe, both in terms of physical interconnection. I've never been so jealous as when I saw that map that he put up there, by the way. <laughs> but also the coupling of energy markets. And I think you know, it is a very important point about how critical a functioning energy market is to the integration of renewables. Um, I think this chart here just shows how the the European energy mix is evolving, and this is a slightly different version of what Arne uh, put forward earlier, but it's the same point. What it shows is that in terms of electricity, its, its proportion of the European energy mix is set to double out to the period to 2050 from about 18% to close to 40%. And then for that electricity mix, in terms of the scenarios that were modeled, we can see that renewables moving from about 18% to somewhere north of 55% and in some cases up to 90%. I mean, that's a huge and staggering um, shift in terms of the overall European energy mix. And I suppose it highlights the importance of, of the seminar here today and, and what we're talking about. Um, I, I use this slide an awful lot. Many of you have seen me put it up before. Um, and it shows the levels of non-synchronous generation in the various power systems across Europe. And this just looks at synchronous power systems. A lot of the time we look at, at, at countries or whatever, but this looks at synchronous power systems. So you have Nor Ireland and Northern Ireland, we have our nearest neighbour in Great Britain, you have the large continental Europe power system, Scandinavia, Cyprus and Malta, the two small ones. And I think, you know, and these are just pulled together from National Renewable Energy Action Plans in terms of targets for people out to 2020. But what you can see is in terms of penetration of wind onto a synchronous power system, the level of ambition here in Ireland and Northern Ireland is significantly ahead of what's been uh, done in other countries. And Petter talked about the scale of ambition in Denmark, and he's connected to two um, synchronous power systems, which brings a whole range of its own challenges, and I think there's a huge amount that we can learn from there. When you have a large amount of renewables on one small synchronous system, there are a whole other set of problems that you need to, to look at and address. And there's some things there that I think that, that where we're at the forefront of developing this, and so there's a huge amount that we can learn and develop and then share around the other power systems um, in Europe in terms of, of moving it forward. So in terms of this morning, I mean, I, I think in transitioning to high, uh, a power system with huge levels of renewables on it, you can book at the challenges into sort of three categories, um, power system and, and technical challenges, financial and market, and political and regulatory. And, and I suppose the theme of today's conference was around managing high levels of renewables on a power system. So I'm just going to talk about the first one. Um, I wouldn't dare anyway talk about regulatory or political matters anyway. Um, and on the system and technical ones, I was just going to look at that, the two dimensions. First, uh, strategic infrastructure, the need to deliver, to enhance and develop the grid so that we can move this renewable power from where it's generated to where it's needed. And also maybe talk just a little bit about uh, the plans for interconnection here where we're at in terms of interconnection existing and also plans for future interconnection. And secondly, maybe talk about the need to um, come up with new and innovative solutions in terms of how we operate the power system, while of course always ensuring that the lights stay on all day, every day. And I suppose this, this latter one is in particular where this um, intertwining of energy and ICT comes particularly to the forefront. Um, so I suppose turning first to the first is to delivery of strategic network infrastructure. We have a network um, program underway, Grid 25. It involves about 200 different projects right around the country, a capital expenditure of about 3.2 billion uh, out to 2025. And that's expanding and uh, extending the network everywhere from Cork to Kildare and from, um, Der uh, from uh, Derry to Donegal. Um, and I suppose over the next few months, three of these major 400 kV projects are going to be coming out into the public domain. A few weeks ago, we launched the next phase of consultation on the Grid West program, which is this one from uh, out into Bella Carrick to connect up uh, wind farms there. 
uh, we started drawing route corridors on a map, and you know, there's been quite a lot of public engagement on that. It's going quite well. The second one is we'll be going back out to public consultation on the north-south interconnector, uh, which has been a traditionally a very difficult project and will continue probably to be a very difficult project. We expect that to be relaunched probably in the next three to four weeks, early, early April. And then later, about uh, a number of weeks after that, the Gridlink project, the next phase of consultation Gridlink, the project that goes 400 kV li to, line 260 kilometres from Cork to Great Ireland and then on up to the south of Dublin. And again, we'll be going out with route corridors on a map. And you know, that tends to engender a different form of conversation with, uh, with communities. But I suppose in that context, we recognize, though, that building this transmission uh, infrastructure is, does have a significant impact on communities and the environment. And you know, we are absolutely committed to ensuring that we do work with all stakeholders to ensure that any issues or concerns are raised, that they're addressed, that people have the opportunity to understand our proposals, to engage with our team, and to ultimately to, to have an, an input into and influence how these projects are ultimately developed. Notwithstanding all of that, it, it, you know, these tend to take a long while to develop and they tend to be uh, difficult uh, projects to, to, to move through the process. Just to talk about um, interconnection just for, for one quick second, I suppose in tandem with making sure that our transmission grid here is, is fit for purpose, we're also looking at opportunities for further interconnection uh, with Europe. Last year we completed the construction of the East-West Interconnector, which is a 500 megawatt HVD DC interconnector with the UK, doubling the interconnection capacity between this island and our, our nearest neighbour. And this will increase security supply, it will increase competition driving prices down, and it also provides a route to market for uh, renewable energies. As some of you will know here, the importance of having a market structure that works is critically important, such that that, that route to market can be captured by the renewables and that they can, can use it. And, and we might come back to that uh, later on in the discussion. But we're now actively looking at other opportunities for further interconnection beyond uh, the East-West Interconnector. Uh, we're just finalizing uh, some initial feasibility studies done in conjunction with the French uh, transmission system operator, RTE, about the feasibility and the benefits for further interconnection with France. And this is showing significant benefits uh, to uh, societies on both sides in terms of producer benefits. And we'll be looking at how we best take that project forward. In addition, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's significant interest in um, large-scale additional interconnection between Ireland and the UK, in particular associated with the Memorandum of Understanding recently signed between uh, the government here and the government in the UK. And what we have done is um, we've worked with our colleagues in UK National Grid to look at how best this could be interconnected with both systems. Um, you know, what's generally talked about is a gig gigawatts of um, wind farms in the Midlands of Ireland connected into and availing of support systems in, in the UK. And what we looked at what 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 we looked at was what was the best way to connect this? Was it best to do it just as a point connection of a wind farm in Ireland as a two specific points in the UK? Or was a connection method where it was integrated with both grids, would that deliver benefits to uh, either or both systems? And the analysis clearly showed that there were significant benefits uh, if this was developed in a manner where the connections were integrated into the grids on, on either side. And there's a report on that available um, on our website. And I suppose this is an ongoing process. I mean, the two governments in associations with the two regulators are looking at framing and setting out this intergovernmental agreement. My understanding of the timeline is that the hope is that that will be done early quarter one next year. Um, and we're working with CER and with other colleagues to try and just frame what is the best way to do this and to move it forward. But th there's an awful lot of an awful lot of interest in it. And in terms of scale, it is very important for, I suppose, for Ireland, Inc., taking a selfish perspective on it, that it's done right. Um, so I suppose moving quickly to the second of my themes, I suppose smart grids and the need for smart grids and innovative solutions. Um, I think that the, the complexity of the electricity system and the energy system is increasing exponentially as levels, renewable levels increase on the system and also as user participation starts to increase with a proliferation of smart devices, smart meters and you know, the extent to which electric um, transportation is electrified through, through the use of uh, electric vehicles. And I suppose to illustrate some of the complexity of this, this is 
a graph of um, real-time operation of the system and the extent to which we can accommodate uh, renew wind on the system today. So today we will manage the system with up to half of the demand being served by uh, renewables or non-synchronous generation in terms of wind. So this is operating in this, in this blue area. And when it goes above, if, if the wind starts to, to blow such that it would go above that, we have to curtail the wind. And Pat had talked about how he won't do that in Denmark, but he has that market that he can export it to, so he's sorted. Um, <laughs> quite often that luxury doesn't exist here, and, and to that extent we need to, to pull it back. What we know is that in order to meet the 40% target, so today we're at about 18% of final energy uh, from renewable sources in, in electricity, to meet the 40% target, without curtailment going sort of through the roof here to unsustainable levels, we know we need to move that 50% up to 75% uh, by 2020. And there's a range of programs underway to do that in order to sort of, if you like, push us down this curve here and to make, to ensure that wind farm projects remain investable. Um, An interconnection also pushes you down this curve or actually creates a second curve which is underneath it, which will reduce the levels as well. Um, so, in order to manage all of that, what we've got is we've got a, a smart grid program that effectively has four strands to it. Um, the first, uh, DS3, this is delivering a secure, sustainable power system. It's a multi-annual program right across industry that looks at how we change the operation of the power system, including changing market arrangements, and we're well advanced in, in terms of looking at the, the system services and how they should be remunerated. It also looks at things like advanced tools in control centers, demand response, and all of that. And we're using an advisory council around that as well to try and ensure that we get input from industry at all stages and trying to bring the industry along with us. So it's quite an intensive program, and many of you in the room here are involved in, in various different aspects of it. The other elements of our smart grid program, I suppose, are uh, the technology and infrastructure piece. And this is looking at how we maximize the utilization of the grid that's there or is being built. And I suppose we've had some particular successes with new uprate technologies, high temperature, low sag conductors. We're looking at dynamic line rating and, inno and innovations such as that to try and push down the costs of, doing the, of integrating renewables onto the system. So this is all about efficiency and effective delivery of grid and using what you have as, as efficiently as possible. Um, the demonstration projects is... That's quite all right. Demonstration projects, that's an initiative where we are looking at taking commercial technologies that are available maybe in other markets or maybe from other purposes and applying them here to see whether they can solve particular problems here. And we've got two that are uh, underway. Uh, one of them actually looks at the uh, integration between heating uh, and the electricity system to see uh, uh, with Glenn Dimplex and, and their quantum heater. And work is quite well advanced on that. And we've got a healthy pipeline of projects out for the next number of years looking at, at things in that space. And the final one is the Smart Grid Innovation Hub, and this is an initiative that we launched with the NDRC, the National Digital Research Centre. And this is about trying to find smart grid concepts out there and provide an environment in which they can be sort of developed, tested, nurtured, and ultimately turned into to commercial propositions. So it's like a, a commercial incubator with a, with a power system sandbox attached to it. And so we have all those sort of working in, in, in a life cycle effect to try and get smarter, better ways to operate the power system to allow us to integrate these levels of renewables in a cost-efficient and effective way as well. Um, so um, I suppose in conclusion, I think you know, the electricity system in Ireland, in Europe, and around the world is changing. At Airgrid, we're committed to ensuring that in Ireland and Northern Ireland, we have a power system that's fit for purpose, that delivers secure, reliable, sustainable power where it's needed, when it's needed. To ensure this, we have a nationwide investment program, GRID 25, to deliver the expanded strategic infra network infrastructure that's needed. And in tandem with that, we're evolving how we operate the system uh, with smart grid solutions. I suppose it, delivering on all of this requires extensive stakeholder and community engagement, which we're absolutely committed to. But the transmission grid is vital strategic infrastructure. Uh, it's the lifeblood of, of the energy system. And you know, it must be developed to ensure that we have secure, sustainable, competitive energy supply that supports the economy, that supports industry, that supports regional development, that supports jobs, supports investment, and supports the harnessing of the terrific renewable resources that we have here for the benefit of everyone. So with that, 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.